tonight on CBC Vancouver News. They were stab wounds to the upper body. A tourist randomly attacked inside a Tim Hortons. What Vancouver police are saying about public safety. Also. This is almost two months, right? We every day waiting, right? The worry and the plea from flood-stricken farmers in the Fraser Valley who say the province isn't helping. And... Personally really excited about it. I don't know. I know a lot of my friends, like some of my friends are pretty nervous and that's understandable. Returning to learn in person. Rapid testing on campus. Why BC University students are torn. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin tonight with a disturbing attack. A 25-year-old tourist is recovering in hospital after being stabbed randomly inside a Vancouver coffee shop. It's the latest in what police call a series of unprovoked attacks and now they're searching for the suspect. Dan Burrett joins us live with more. Dan, take us through what happened in this case. Anita, first of all, a warning for our viewers. The video you were about to see is disturbing. It happened Saturday morning just before 6.30. Police say the victim, who was from Mexico, walked into a Tim Hortons at Harbour Centre on Seymour near Cordova. That's him there on the right. The suspect was the man sitting down. He then stands up and may say a few words to the victim there. About a minute or so passes, then the suspect charges, stabbing the victim in the back several times before he runs out of the store. The victim was rushed to hospital with what police called life-threatening injuries, though he's expected to survive. The suspect seen there is said to be about in his 20s, six foot two with a slim build, short black hair, wearing a gray hoodie with a black hood and sleeves, a backpack and a black and white face mask with a Crooks and Castle logo on it. The victim in this case is a tourist. He's only been in the country for, um, I think, since October. Um, he doesn't speak uh, much English. He's told us that there was no prior interaction. We know from the investigation and from reviewing video that um, the suspect in this case had entered the coffee shop about 20 minutes earlier. Police say this is just the latest in a string of unprovoked attacks in the city over the past month. Last week, we showed you this video, the force released of a man attacking a woman on New Year's Eve on West Georgia Street near Howe. It's also believed to be random. The VPD claims its own data shows more than four people a day are victims of unprovoked stranger attacks. The force says it will be spe stepping up patrols in affected areas. CBC News did contact Tim Hortons and Harbour Centre to ask if they are stepping up security after this attack. Neither have responded to us yet. Anita. Dan Burrett, live tonight. Thank you. North Cowichan RCMP is looking for a father and his seven-year-old daughter. 36-year-old Jesse Bennett was reported missing yesterday afternoon. On Thursday, a Victoria Family Law Court set out a joint custody agreement and ordered him to return his daughter Violet to her mother. The RCMP say he is evading the police and violating the order. Violet Bennett is described as a white girl who is approximately four feet tall. She has blue eyes and big natural curly hair. Her father is a white male with blue eyes, brown hair, and a beard. Police say he has a shaved head and could be wearing a hat. Anyone with information of their whereabouts is asked to contact police. Blueberry farmers in Abbotsford say they have yet to receive any financial aid from the province after the devastating floods. They say the process of regrowing their crops could take more than a decade. And as Michelle Gassoub reports, they're pressing the province to help them get that rebuild started sooner. What's going to happen in another month? You know, there's no point coming here and pruning these fields. Tony Sidhu's blueberries were underwater for 28 days. The path to regrowing them is a long one. The journey to get back to that is 10 years after planting to get back to those production levels. Sidhu and other blueberry farmers on the Sumas Prairie now face a choice. Try to prune the plants that remain or rip and replace them completely. But without direction from the province about what aid they'll receive, there's little they can do. There's 750 to 1,000 acres that fall under that tier that need to be ripped and replaced. And we need to get some direction in terms of what we're, uh, where we're going from here. And we need uh, 
financial relief. The farmer is also frustrated that after nearly a month, the province hasn't responded to a report sent by the BC Blueberry Council that details the damage and the full cost of rebuilding. We need help to tell them, right, and uh, no one listens yet. Uh, this is almost two months, right? We every day waiting, right? Someone come to lock our situation, right? The province says a plan for financial support is coming soon. But frustrated by the delay, the farmers met with opposition members today for a tour of the damage, another attempt to keep the Sumas Prairie disaster in the public eye. The message for British Columbians is don't be deceived by how great this area appears to look for the, uh, the farmers and the producers and the agri-food sector, um, it's a bit of an illusion because the economic devastation is real and lasting. The province sent a long list of areas that will be eligible for financial support, including the restoration of agricultural land. But farmers say the new infrastructure and financial planning can't simply replace the old. We need something designed that pertains to this disaster. This is a disaster due to neglect and there should be something designed for this and it should be accessible to growers to get their get back on their feet again and do what they do. The start of a 10 to 12 year ordeal to bring these BC blueberries back to where they once grew. Michelle Gassoub, CBC News, Vancouver. While traffic is moving once again through B.C.'s Fraser Canyon along Highway 1, the major route linking Hope with Lytton reopened today at noon. It had been closed since mid-November's floods, washouts and landslides. The province is advising drivers to expect delays of up to two hours as some sections remain single lane. Temporary closures are also in effect for avalanche control as repairs continue at Jackass Mountain and the Nikomin River crossing. The number of people in hospital with COVID-19 in B.C. is now higher than ever at just under 1,000. 129 of those hospitalized are in intensive care. Over the past two weeks, the number of unvaccinated people in hospital has been more than quadruple that of fully vaccinated people. 24 more people have died since Friday. More than 2,500 people in B.C. have died of the virus since the beginning of the pandemic. And the province has declared six new health care outbreaks for a total of 64. Well, classes back in person for students at SFU, Kwatlin and UVic. And while many seem eager to get back to that in-person learning, some say the return is not welcome. Zara Premji now on a walkout staged at the SFU Burnaby campus today. We're all here today to make our voices heard. A direct message from dozens of SFU students to the administrators at the institution. Shame. 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 SFU do a better job with um, reaching out to your students and just seeing how they feel about this. While students return to in-person learning Monday at SFU, UVic and Kwantlen in the midst of a fifth wave of COVID-19, the safety of the return is being questioned by many at the school. Am I going to get it? Am I going to be sitting next to someone who has it and just get it like that? In person is amazing. You get to interact with your peers and things like that. But in the middle of a pandemic, I don't know how much of a productive decision that is. And they're joined by the more than 4,000 students who have also signed an online petition asking for distance education to continue at SFU for at least one more semester. The walkout at SFU was planned as a protest against the return to in-person education, but also a call for additional supports from the university for students at all three campuses. Where is the hybrid learning? Where are the N95 masks provided by SFU? Rapid tests, extended course withdrawals, deadlines? SFU tells CBC supports and accommodations can be made for those registered with a disability as well as anyone who doesn't feel comfortable. It adds it's following guidance from public health authorities and SFU's provost says the lecture hall setting isn't where Omicron transmission is being seen. Over at UVic, a return to in-person learning today as well, but the feeling's a little different for some. Overall, I think that like learning in person is a much better experience and I'm excited to be back. <laughs> and it's nice to get outside and not, you know, be in a Zoom call in your pajamas or whatnot. Back at SFU, some students say they'll keep protesting for their safety. I don't think we should have to choose between our education and our safety. 
These protesters hoping the university will change its mind and go the route UBC has taken. It has extended virtual learning to at least February 7th. Zara Premji, CBC News, Burnaby. A pilot project aimed at getting passengers through the Canada-U.S. border faster is being tested at YVR tonight. Using the ArriveCan app, Vancouver-bound travelers can send their customs declaration to border services even before the plane lands. And the CBSA says facial recognition cameras will be moving Nexus cardholders through electronic gates, shortening wait times. The goal is to eventually get people through land borders faster as well in as little as 15 seconds. Travelers can still opt to make customs declarations to a CBSA officer rather than use the app if they choose. The pilot project happening at Toronto's Pearson International as well. well. One of the most hotly anticipated trials in B.C. political history got underway this morning. Former legislature House Clerk Craig James is on trial in B.C. Supreme Court for breach of trust and fraud. James is accused of claiming a quarter million dollar retirement allowance he was not entitled to and using legislature funds to buy a wood splitter and trailer that he kept at his house. He's also accused of filing improper travel expenses. James has pleaded not guilty to each of the five charges against him. The trial is expected to last six weeks and includes testimony from 27 witnesses. Well, new computer modeling from SFU researchers is set to improve avalanche forecasting to help save lives across BC. By having more tools to make these forecasts more accurate, precise and localized, we'll hopefully be able to offer better advice for people going out so that they can make safer decisions in the mountains. According to a new study, the simulated snow cover models developed by researchers are able to detect and track weak layers of snow. That means they'll be able to identify avalanche hazards in a new way, providing forecasters with another reliable tool when local data is insufficient. Currently, avalanche forecasts in Canada are made by relying on data from local weather stations and on-the-ground observations. Millions of space debris are constantly orbiting the Earth's atmosphere, but it's not often that they put on a flashy display visible to the naked eye. That's what happened in Fort Nelson when a meteor lit up the neighborhood last night. A doorbell camera managed to capture the fireball headed toward the ground and the explosion that came after. People in Charlie Lake, Tupper, Upper Cache and other parts of northeastern BC have also reported sightings. It was brighter than usual because the rock is actually larger in diameter than a typical meteor. Astronomers refer to it as a bolide. And when these bolides enter our Earth's atmosphere, they explode. Okay, and, and then, you know, when they explode, you can see a bright flash of light. Bolides travel at a speed of up to 70 kilometers per second. And if it's big enough, it could create a small crater if it hits the ground. Kendurkar is unsure about the size of this bolide, but he doesn't think it's too big. Just incredible. I cannot imagine capturing that on my camera or seeing it in person. A little bit scary, especially with some of the new movies yeah. that are out right now. <laughs> I was just going to say, yeah, hashtag don't look up yeah. at that one. But uh, I continue to learn. I did not know that those were called full lights. So thank you for that. Now, we couldn't look up if we wanted to here in Metro Vancouver. It is shrouded in fog uh, for the most part, really kicking in on Sunday. We did see some uh, break in the fog down towards Richmond, Delta. And then out towards the valley, you had beautiful clear outs earlier today, uh, really Chilliwack eastward getting into sunshine, but everyone else, that fog is returning. Let me show you the temperatures. It's really telling the story of what will be our story for the next five plus days. A strong high pressure is trapping a warm layer of air just above a cool layer, leading to our classic inversion and trapped fog. So three right now in YVR, one out towards Abbotsford, a minus one up towards Squamish, and temps likely to get down to the freezing mark, if not lower tonight. Here's a look at the water vapor uh, satellite, and you can see there is some lightning in the cloud down towards uh, Richmond and Delta, really the only places across Metro Vancouver that saw some good sunny breaks. As we head into the forecast, we're gonna have to sort of play it day by day. The setup will mean fog develops overnight, thick in the morning, and we'll have to see if we get an outflow strong enough to kick out some of that fog in the afternoon. So taking you through Tuesday, it does look like it's a pretty thick inversion layer. So heading up 
even uh, 300, 400 meters above sea level uh, should do the trick. Local mountains are a perfect spot, Anita, but uh, we'll see if we can find any uh, afternoon sunny breaks in uh, otherwise a very fog poover forecast. <laughs> no kidding. Okay, thanks, Joe. <laughs> You're welcome. The weather update is brought to you by Sophia Financial Group of Raymond James Limited. Register now for our free cash flow connection series at sophiaevents.ca. The Canucks have hired the first female assistant GM in team history as the leadership change in their front office continues. I never thought, hey, you know, there's only men in this industry. I can't do this. Um, I just kind of got all the knowledge that I thought I could get to get to where I am today. And I just put my head down and did the work. Um, you know, I think if you let gender get in your way or if you let it intimidate you, that's when it will do that. Emily Castongay comes to the team from the world of player management. She was the first female agent certified by the NHL Players Association. The team says her focus will be on player contracts and negotiations, and she'll have influence in all of the team's hockey operations. Well, you've probably seen the pictures. Empty shelves at grocery stores across the country as a truck convoy protesting vaccine mandates heads east. What's the truth about supply shortages and what's to blame? We try to answer those questions next. And we'll take you inside the disputed territory of Donbass between Ukraine and Russia. The CBC's Briar Stewart takes you into a region that is feeling the pinch as tensions rise even higher. Thanks for staying with us in our commercial-free live stream. Well, heavy snow can sometimes deter people from heading out and doing outdoor activities like jogging. But Edmonton has trails that can accommodate that. The Chikaku Lake hiking trail is one, and it's an hour west of the city. Have a look. I started running probably about four years ago now. I needed to get out and be active and, and, and exercise. And so I, I started coming out here by myself, bought a pair of running shoes, you know, from a local store. and just started venturing on the trails. It's amazing how it feels like you're in the middle of nowhere. Like you can be out and out in the forest and in the trees and you can run into a moose. And then five minutes later, you can run into, you know, your friends from town type thing. It's just like, it is such a remote but local place that we have available to us out here. It's a good, close option for people in Spruce Grove, Stony Plain to get out and do some recreation activities, whether it's like us on snowshoes or cross country skiing or running. It's neat. This is our first time out this winter on our snowshoes. So we're just going to go and give it a go and see how far we can make it and how comfortable we are. It's beautiful out here today. It's got beautiful trails. It's got about 10K of big wide trails that you can get anything from strollers to sleds on. And about uh, 11 to 14 kilometers of single track trail that you can run on, snowshoe on, bike on, anything. Like it's, it's such a easy access location. But this is where I train for ultra marathons as well. So everything from running, you know, crazy amounts of mileage and really technical terrain to, you know, walking with a stroller. You can do anything here. I think it grounds us. It kind of gives us a little bit of peace and resets us for our busy lives. Being in nature out here and, and the peace of the woods, it's, it's the quiet, it's the calm, you know, to connect with my thoughts, connect with what I'm feeling, but also just kind of connect with this land and, and how beautiful it is and what a gift it is to be able to be out here.
So are the shelves in your local grocery aisles looking a little bare right now? Well, supply chain issues are hitting stores nationwide. Allison Northcott is looking into what's behind it all as a protest amongst a group of truckers plays out across the country. On a Winnipeg street, a convoy of trucks and other vehicles protest vaccine mandates. Because it affects jobs, it affects everyone's truckers, farmers, you name it. Other convoys are headed all the way to Ottawa to protest new rules requiring cross-border truckers to be vaccinated. The Canadian Trucking Alliance says the vast majority of Canadian truckers are vaccinated and says it disapproves of protests on public roadways. Some premiers are waiting in. Is it just going to essentially have a, a negative uh, result in us not being able to access uh, the, the, the goods and services uh, that truckers bring to our community each and every day? Alberta Premier Jason Kenney tweeted photos of empty grocery store shelves, blaming the mandate and calling for the policy to end. The Canadian Federation of Independent Grocers says the trucking mandate is just one of several factors that might lead to some Canadians not finding all they want at the grocery store, along with labour shortages and extreme weather. It doesn't mean the shelves are completely barren or anything like that, but we're already starting to see for some products where we're, they're just not coming in time or we're not getting them in the quantities um, that, that we need. Come a couple of times and there haven't been garbage bags. And spices. The spices are really low. Yeah, you, you feel it. So now I'm, you know, I'm, I'm having to pick and choose. This Edmonton store is struggling with workers off sick and unpredictable deliveries. So if we are typically waiting three days on an order, let's give it six days now. The trucker mandate is extra pressure on a strained system, but there is still plenty of food available, says this expert. I don't think we're going to be running out of food at grocery stores. We may see some outages of certain products. He says consumers shouldn't panic or panic buy. That will only make things worse. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Quebec is attempting a move no other province has in trying to convince holdouts to get vaccinated. Starting today, the province has asked larger retailers like Costco to require a vaccine passport for entry. As Rowan Kennedy reports, the change is getting mixed reactions. I thought it was going to be implemented further down the line. Unaware he would need a vaccine passport to get in, Spiro Plagakis was also surprised by the 20-minute long lineup the requirement would create at this Montreal Costco. I was surprised when I uh, came in that there was a lineup because, you know, usually at this time there aren't any lineup. It's cold outside, man. Anything that makes this line longer doesn't really help the situation, but I understand why it has to be done. As of today in Quebec, if you want to shop in any store bigger than 1,500 meters squared, prepare to pull out your vaccination passport and a piece of ID. The economy minister, Pierre Fitzgibbon, says it's a sacrifice that we have to make in the face of the Omicron variant's effect on hospitals. The province also hopes the measure will get more people vaccinated. Among those that are unhappy are some of the stores who have to enforce the new measure. C'est l'événement qui a créé le plus d'agressivité envers nous dans, depuis deux ans. The director of marketing at this hardware store says the move has led to the most aggressiveness from customers since the beginning of the pandemic. And the Retail Council of Canada says its members are struggling to find enough staff to enforce the measure. It's another a uh, level of pressure on the shoulder of the actual staff, so it's a major challenge for, for everyone. Still, the expansion of the vaccine passport in Quebec is being welcomed by some who say it's made shopping feel just a little bit safer. Some people wearing their masks this way, so if I know that they're vaccinated, I, I worry a little less when they're next to me at the, at the cash. Large shops deemed essential, such as grocery stores and pharmacies, are exempt from the vaccination passport. And if a pharmacy is inside of a big box store like Costco, an unvaccinated person will have to be accompanied by an employee. Rowan Kennedy, CBC News, Montreal. An Alberta woman who rented a truck for a few hours has had to spend almost a year fighting a claim against her. She was dinged more than $5,500 for hail damage by the rental company, even though the skies were clear when she had been on the road. Erica Johnson from the CBC's Go Public has the details. When Kelly Chick dropped off the keys after renting a truck from Enterprise for a day, she figured all was well. Wow, $5,500. 
She didn't expect to get a letter saying she was on the hook for hail damage. It was sunny and clear all day, so I was pretty flabbergasted as to how they could even, you know, bring this back to me and try to pin it on me for hail damage. She'd rented a truck in Dawson Creek, B.C., drove seven hours to Red Deer, Alberta. Two months later, Enterprise sent photos of hail damage and pointed to a clause in the rental agreement saying renter accepts responsibility for damage, even if it's an act of God, which includes bad weather. All car rental companies have similar clauses. To say the least, it's super frustrating. When she picked up the truck, it was dusk. The vehicle was covered in snow and ice, she says. As it melted the next morning, a photo she took herself showed pockmarks on the truck's hood. She sent the photo and a weather report to Enterprise, but the company still sent the claim to Collections, which called her at all hours. The bill grew to over 6000 this consumer law prof says car rental companies need to prove damage happened during the rental period. The onus is on the big rental car company to prove their case. No evidence, they're going to lose. Go Public asked Environment Canada to check the weather during Kelly Chick's rental. A spokesperson said she would not have encountered damaging hail during her drive. After Go Public got involved, the car rental giant said it was unable to conclusively determine its customer was responsible for hail damage. Enterprise dropped its claim and apologized. It did not say why it held its customer responsible for so long with so little evidence. Erica Johnson, CBC News, Vancouver. To the U.S. now, where uncertainty over Ukraine and a possible Russian invasion made stock markets extra nervous today. The Dow lost a staggering 1,100 points before rebounding late in the day to post a gain. The economic situation striking a presidential nerve at the White House. A uh, Fox News reporter shouted a question about inflation, and President Biden clapped back, apparently thinking his microphone was off. It's an area of the world few journalists have ever been allowed into. The city of Donetsk lies between Ukraine and Russia, the capital of a now self-declared independent country. Inside the beleaguered city, next. Tonight on Canada at Large, new adventures in pay TV. Thanks to improved technology, more and more Canadians are getting exactly what they pay for on the tube. And last night, for the first time ever, Canadian viewers bought themselves a hockey game. Here's the CBC's Ian Hanamansing on Hockey for Hire. It's hockey night in Vancouver, and some sports history is being made. Not on the ice, but up here in the broadcast booth. Last night's Canucks game was part of a four-game pay-per-view package. The first time in Canada, TV viewers have been asked to pay to watch an NHL game at home. Hey, we've got a great feature for our pay-per-view audience. An audience of hockey fans like Lee McDonald, who happily shelled out $9 for the game, even though 42 other Canucks games are on TV this season free of charge. This provides a good option to... Uh to view a game that normally wouldn't be on regular cable television. You might think if enough people are willing to pay to watch a game like this at home, then in the future, fewer and fewer NHL games will be on free TV. But the Vancouver Canucks insist that's not going to happen. It could be a high-scoring game. The Canucks' parent company, Orca Bay, says the team needs the mass exposure that only regular hockey telecasts can provide. We still need free TV to get our message out to sell our tickets because that's our number one source of revenue. Only about 81,000 households in British Columbia have the converter that receives pay-per-view. The Canucks say about 2,800 of those ordered the first game. That's not much compared to the hundreds of thousands who watch Hockey Night in Canada. But just wait. We're very excited about pay-per-view sports. Rogers Cable says in a matter of months, digital cable will be here and soon Canadian direct broadcast satellites. Both will have hundreds of new channels that will need to be filled. There will be dozens and dozens of sports channels, and that means, hopefully, lots of uh, sports pay-per-view will come on board from all over the place. In, front, the in turn, cable companies hope that will draw more customers to pay-per-view. Both Rogers and the Canucks say this series of games might give them an idea of just how many people are willing to pay to watch a game on TV. Ian Hanamansing, CBC News, Vancouver. 
Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. A 25-year-old man is in hospital with life-threatening injuries after being randomly stabbed inside a Tim Hortons in downtown Vancouver. The victim, who is a tourist to BC, was standing in line inside the restaurant at the Harbour Centre when he was approached from behind. Police hope this surveillance video will help identify the suspect. The journey to get back to that is 10 years after planting to get back to those production levels. Blueberry farmers in Abbotsford say they have yet to receive any financial aid from the province after the devastation left by the floods. They say the process of regrowing their crops could take more than a decade, and now they're pressing the province to help them get that rebuild started sooner. Police on Vancouver Island are searching for a man and his seven-year-old daughter reported missing yesterday afternoon. Jesse Bennett was supposed to return young Violet to her mother in the Duncan North Cowichan area, but he's been out of contact and he's currently breaching a custody order. If you've seen the two, you are asked to call RCMP. Well, even as the West pushes for a diplomatic solution to escalating tensions between Russia and Ukraine, it is bracing and today further preparing for an all-out war. The hope is diplomacy will work, but as Susan Ormiston shows us, Western nations are getting ready in case it doesn't. U.S. troops readying to go to Europe, 8,500 on heightened alert. To make sure uh, that we're ready uh, to bolster the NATO alliance. As President Biden sends a military missive to President Putin, and the UK's but Prime Minister warns. Invading Ukraine from a, from a Russian perspective is going to be a painful, violent and bloody business. Biden briefed European leaders for an hour and a half looking for a cohesive front. I had a very, very, very good meeting, total unanimity with all the European leaders. Supporting a NATO buildup. It's happening already. Additional warships and fighter jets being positioned in member countries close to Ukraine. We are considering to further enhance our presence in the eastern part of the alliance. This could include the deployment of additional NATO battle groups. U.S. military assistance arriving in Kyiv over the weekend with more on the way. Diplomats' families from the U.S. and U.K. embassies are leaving Kyiv. Canada so far is not withdrawing staff. Safety of Canadian diplomats and their families is, of course, paramount, uh, and we will continue uh, to be there for Ukraine. The Kremlin accuses the West of hysteria, elevating the risks. But Putin shows no sign of de-escalating, sending more military into Belarus. That country key to the crisis, says a former U.S. ambassador. Uh, I think from the Russian standpoint, certainly from the Kremlin standpoint, the worst of all possible worlds would be if Belarus and uh, Ukraine both went westward and left Russia behind. I think that's, to some extent, one of the motivators of why the Russians are creating this crisis now. We're about to take you into a part of the world foreign journalists are not usually allowed to enter. It sits near the Russia and Ukraine border. Now, the region is called Donetsk, and its fighting between the Ukrainian military and Russian-backed separatists began there eight years ago. Parts are now self-declared republics controlled by pro-Russian groups. But Ryer Stewart and a CBC News crew were recently granted exclusive access beyond the control line. Take a look at what they found. It's a rare look at the outskirts of Donetsk, where some blocks appear frozen in time. 
scarred from a deadly eight-year war that threatens to erupt again. If you're going through Ukraine, the only way into this place is through a series of checkpoints and roadblocks. You need permission from the Ukrainian military, as well as from Russian-backed separatists, who frequently deny the scrutinizing glare of the foreign media. But CBC was recently given access to go over the control line that divides the Donbass. We're finally driving into Donetsk after spending about eight hours at the border crossing. It's one thing to get permission to come to this area, but actually going over the border is really like a gauntlet. During our time in Donetsk, we were accompanied by an escort, including in villages near the front line, like Oktoberskaya. This community saw some of the heaviest fighting, and in a nearly deserted street, we met Mikhail Kravchuk, who was on his way to feed some chickens. His house is on this block, but he and his wife don't live here anymore. He says they stayed as long as they could before they were forced to run for their lives during the intense fighting back in 2014. Is your dream to one day be able to live in the house again? As he leads us into the yard, he points to more damage from a rocket that was fired nearby in 2015. In the back, he shows us how we had to crouch behind a metal sheet during another attack. Scattered around are shell casings because even amid a war, he's a practical man and he uses them to collect water for his garden, one of the ways he's trying to rebuild his fragile life. Inside his home, pictures of his sons. The oldest died while trying to flee during shelling. Начинаю сомневаться. Чем дальше, тем что просто я хочу вернуться, чтобы умереть здесь. Most of the destruction in Donetsk happened during the early days of the war. The airport was an epicenter of one of the battles between Russian-backed separatists and the Ukrainian military. It still lies in ruin. More than 14,000 people have been killed on both sides of the 420-kilometer dividing line. Next, we traveled 30 kilometers southeast of Donetsk to the community of Alexandrivka and met the Azorin family, where three generations live together in a meager house in a mining town. All of the adults here say they've nearly died after being caught up in shelling. For Vida, it was in November when she was on her way to work. Then a month later, her husband, 52-year-old Pyotr, was hit by shrapnel. He had surgery but was told 20 pieces are still embedded in him. But some scars aren't as visible. Five-year-old Yaroslav doesn't speak much. His family believes he's traumatized by the war going on around him. The war and border have divided families in the region and left Donetsk more isolated. The self-proclaimed republic isn't recognized by Canada or most of the world. 900,000 live in this city, where an 11 p.m. curfew was in place most of the week, but lifted on the weekend. On a Saturday night, young people take advantage of the extra hours at a bar downtown. While most wanted to enjoy their evening and not wade into the contentious topics of politics and war, a few told us they don't like living here 
and would leave if they could. She told us she wants to move to Moscow soon. And nearly every day of the week, buses full of locals return from Russia, where residents have picked up newly minted Russian passports. Here, the connection and influence are obvious and everywhere. The Republic's flag flies beside Russia's. Signs around the city boast of a Russian Donbass. Абсолютно большинство наших граждан хочет быть как можно ближе к России. The leader of the Donetsk People's Republic, Denis Pushilin, told us he wished the region went the same way as Crimea. By that he means voting to join Russia, even though most of the international community saw that referendum as illegitimate. We also asked what kind of help Russia is now giving to Donetsk. We are forced to protect our borders, but it would be extremely difficult to do it if there was no humanitarian support. He insisted there are no Russian troops on the ground here. As for the troop buildup near Ukraine's border, he dismissed fears of a large-scale invasion. Most here aren't panicked by the prospect either, because they've been resigned to the conflict around them. Before we leave Donetsk, we visit the apartment Mikhail Kravchuk and his wife Natalia are renting. The smell of fresh cake wafts through the air in their cozy kitchen. But beneath the smiles, the pain is still raw. After being married for more than 50 years, they just want to be able to move back to their home. И будем перебираться, если, конечно, не будет эскалации, которую грозятся сотворить. А так мы всей душой там. For now, he's left holding on to the memories of his family's life on the street before they lived in the shadow of war. Friar Stewart, CBC News, Donetsk. The glaciers of Canada are melting away as climate change impacts ice fields throughout the country. Why new models suggest it's all happening much faster than we once thought. That's coming up. And at 642, a live look at the Canby Bridge. A foggy day here in the Lower Mainland. So is it going to roll back in? Well, Johanna has the answer and the full weather next. Don't forget about me. <laughs> How could I possibly? Ice is slippery. Yeah. We are here at the Leaside Curling Club to find out what in the Olympic Winter Games is this. What's that thing? Ah, oh, that is easy. Mm. It's a unicorn cycle. Mm. I'm just not sure how you get on. No. I think that's the seat part. No, 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 no. Gary, come over here. I'll show you. <laughs> oh. 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 Whoa. Are you okay? Yeah. Just you want to hold up? Yeah, hang on. Just, just hold that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, oh, easy. thank you. Careful. Oh, yay. Easy. There you go. This, Gary, is a curling rock. Alley. Oh. <laughs> Sweep. Hard. Yeah. Not too hard. Curlers work together to get a rock inside a target known as a house. The house has three circles, and the center circle is the button. Closest to the button wins the points. It takes practice, but don't worry. You'll get it, Gary. Hey, look at me, Mr. Orlando. I'm on the unicorn cycle. Oh, wait a minute. Whoa, I better sit down. Get back, Gary, that's not how it works. You'll yeah. never get it. Like that. <laughs> Did I do it? Uh, am I in the house? Uh, yes, you're in the house. <gasps> Woohoo! Unicorn in the house! 
Oh, I gotta get out of this house. I pay a lot of attention to the rates, and I can just tell within six months that my money was declining. I can make a possible 2000 a week to now I make hopefully $1,000. So that's 50%. My car is running down to the point where I just don't know one day I'm going to go to my car and it's just not going to start. Uber has managed to externalize the cost of workers to workers themselves. They force workers to basically um, be independent contractors and then try and take revenue through the transactions that occur on the platform. That is effectively their business model. Uber and Lyft, those companies, they pay the most intelligent people in the world. Professors, programmers, everything you can imagine and they forgot about the drivers. We have no voice to that companies at all. I was making $1.95 a mile. Now I'm making 60 to 66 cents. It doesn't make any sense. I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Get Metro Vancouver news that matters to you all in one place with the free CBC News app. It's easy to use. Open the app and set your local tab to BC for news that's curated to you. And you can even watch live streams of CBC Vancouver News at 6 with Anita Bath and other CBC News broadcasts on the go. Download the free CBC News app and stay connected to where you live. CBC's Municipal Affairs reporter Justin McElroy has been named one of Vancouver Magazine's 50 Most Influential People. The deciding panel chose McElroy for his work on the COVID-19 pandemic. That includes consistently pressuring health and government authorities for more data about the virus. And of course, using that data to produce graphs and charts to accurately reflect the COVID-19 reality here in B.C., the magazine describes McElroy as an authority on the biggest issue in a century for an entire generation of British Columbians who have turned to his Twitter account for critical news since spring of 2020. All right, Marine meteorologist Ren Wake staff is here now with the forecast. Um, Joe, I have to say the fog was absolutely beautiful yesterday and today, so I'm kind of hoping it's sticking around, but you got to tell me what's happening. I'm glad you said that, Anita. Yeah, we've heard a lot in the, uh, the con category for the fog, but it really is very moody if, uh, yeah, you can mm -hmm. put on a, a different kind of attitude. We've got a few more moody mornings than for fog lovers out there. Let me start you off with the current temperatures from coast to coast. Really sets the scene. We've got this big ridge of high pressure, and you can see it's uh, B.C., most of Alberta, up through the north uh, into Alaska, sharing in uh, this warmer air mass. The rest of the country... Arctic air mass is once again uh, descending across central Canada and Toronto getting hit with another round of snow tonight. Uh, St. John's waiting for 40 centimeters of snow over the next couple of days. Uh, here's how our high pressure ridge will play out. So keep your eye on the yellow. This is uh, a big picture of the upper level uh, patterns and that sometimes gives us a good idea of how things are going to change. So you can see we've got this big ridge uh, this high pressure system shown there in the yellow and the orange, it actually dips a little bit tomorrow. And as it dips, that may allow some mixing. So I think tomorrow afternoon, there is a chance of seeing some sunshine uh, into Wednesday, but then it builds back in again for Thursday and Friday. And then Friday into the weekend, that ridge flattens right out. We lose it for the weekend. We get some rain returning for Sunday and we get cooler temperatures for early next week. It looks like we're getting into uh, a very cool pattern uh, from one week till now. So I'll keep you posted on that. That's the big picture. Let's get down to the uh, forecast for everyone. Kelowna one tomorrow, you're looking at a chance for valley fog to stick around. Same story through the Kootenays with highs to minus two. 
Prince George, patchy fog once again. You did see some brilliant sunshine today with highs to one. And Prince Rupert, you're really on the edge of that jet stream, so drizzle for most of your Tuesday as well. Port Hardy, you're in the clear. The only place across the South Coast not under the fog advisory today. Uh, we're seeing that widespread fog move in once again as we speak, becoming quite dense. So taking you through the big picture over the next 24 hours, uh, lots of cloud cover as that bridge uh, weakens, as I showed you. So that's going to allow some mixing, but higher cloud to move in. But it'll be nice to see some brightness for a moment. Uh, long range forecast, I've got to keep the fog in uh, right through to about Friday. And then we'll uh, see that system move in for Sunday. Uh, that definitely uh, is just looking at a risk of, you know what, I um, let this is Edmonton's forecast. Hang on a second. We cannot let you get, get by. I switched way too fast through the graphic. That is so alarming. Let me put your mind at ease in three, two, one. Oh my goodness. So, <laughs> so sorry for that panic, everyone. Uh, there we go. Seven on Sunday. That is rain. These are less ridiculous temperatures. Uh, speaking of less ridiculous and sticking to the science, I wanted to show you uh, some new science coming out of the University of Northern British Columbia last week, and I got to speak to the lead author, but a new way to study our glaciers. Take a listen. I think if you rely on you know hydroelectric power, if you rely on um, any kind of you know mountain environments for you know transport or you know, there are pipelines that go near glaciers. There are all kinds of things that, uh, that, that are ways that glaciers influence everyone's daily lives. I think there's a lot of concern and a lot of models have shown that, you know, BC might have, you know, 100 years left of, you know, glaciated environments. And I think we're maybe underestimating that. That's Alex Bevington, the lead author on a new paper from the University of Northern British Columbia. He's developed a new tool to map Western Canada's glaciers using satellites. Essentially, the last time that glaciers were systematically mapped in British Columbia and Alberta was in 2005. So since then, we have really no idea where the glaciers you know, are. I mean, we know where they are. They're, we know where they were in 2005, but they've changed quite a bit since then. So we took about 12,000 satellite images, and we developed an automatic mapping tool to be able to map the glaciers without human intervention. And so that's important because we have about 14,000 glaciers in British Columbia. We all probably know by now that climate change is shrinking Canada's glaciers. But what the data from space also showed was that they're shrinking at an accelerated rate. And it's a trend that will continue to accelerate according to forward modeling. For every degree of warming, BC and Alberta will lose roughly 500 square kilometers of ice. The team picked up on something else too. As the glaciers lose mass and get smaller, another geologic feature is actually growing. There's lakes growing at the front of glaciers. We call them proglacial lakes. And this is something that we really have no grasp on um, in British Columbia. We don't know where all these lakes are. We don't know how fast they're growing. And lakes are uh, important um, because they also uh, present a bit of a risk. Glacier forefields are quite dynamic environments. You get a lot of landsliding, you get a lot of chunks of ice falling off. It's a, it's a very dynamic environment. And if you have a lake, um, those lakes are more susceptible to you know, blowing out and having, having downstream consequences. Alex and his team were able to show the area of proglacial lakes grew five times faster over this last decade in Western Canada. Add to that the fact that glaciers represent a critical source of stored freshwater in Western Canada, and it makes protecting them by drastically reducing human-induced greenhouse gases all the more important. And now, you're science smart. If you have a science question on your mind, send me a tweet. I'll try to get it answered. It's set to change the way we look at space, as the James Webb Telescope is put into action. What we might see and discover is next. This year's elk count numbers are slightly down from 2020 and have been trending lower over the past five years. But Parks Human Wildlife Coexistence Officer Blair Fighton says it's typical for wildlife population numbers to rise and fall. Um, not alarming. Our sh goal or strategy for the Bow Valley was to try and have 150 to 300 elk within the Bow Valley. So, you know, we're within those limits of uh, what we'd like to see here. Fighton adds they might miss some elk during the count and says it may not represent total population numbers. 
He says they identified at least 36 elk deaths in the area last year, with about 20 carcasses connected to predators like wolves, cougars and bears. We're looking at his increased predation. You know, we also have um, the highway and the railroad track. Um, you know, some elk get uh, hit and killed there. Um, we got cougars last year. It was uh, a lot of cougar activity around town through the wintertime there. And, you know, definitely those cougars were killing some of the elk. Fighton says the Bow Valley Wolf Pack appears to be healthy. They've noticed some wolves coming closer to the town site looking for prey in recent years. He adds elk attempt to use that area as a refuge from predators. Fighton recommends people give elk plenty of space for safety. He says they continue to look for the animals around town and use hazing strategies to encourage them to leave. Dave Gilson, CBC News, Banff. Freelance urban ecologist Matt Wallace has put a spin on this year's Christmas bird counts and created species heat maps. We can actually begin to understand trends as to where birds are, the number of birds, the types of birds. His color-coded maps show that magpies, well, they love the Beltline, but weren't squawking as much in Bowness. And geese are fans of the city southeast where there's open water and a quick commute to rural food sources. We have huge numbers of mallards and Canada geese within the city, which is unlike places like Edmonton. Kaya Konopnicki with Nature Calgary says the maps are a great addition. Creating these maps and being able to show people visually where birds are uh, makes the data more real and people can actually see it instead of just looking at numbers in a chart. So I think it brings the data alive. The Christmas bird count is a snapshot. What birds were seen where in Calgary on December 19th? In total, 72 species were spotted. Helen Pike, CBC News, Calgary. In the year 2050, how will BC look? From agriculture to cities, how will climate change change life? Don't miss 2050 Degrees of Change, a CBC Vancouver original podcast, now available. The world's most powerful space telescope has docked into position at an observation post one and a half million kilometers from Earth. It took more than a month to launch the James Webb Telescope's voyage. As Jayla Bernstein reports, scientists are now laying the final groundwork before they can begin discovering more secrets the universe has in store. On Christmas Day, these scientists watch their life's work launch into space. The James Webb Space Telescope was finally off, but there was still a perilous journey ahead. I've been describing this as the 14 days of terror, but really it's been 14 days of joy uh, because the, the whole process went uh, flawlessly. After launch, there were exactly 344 things that could have gone wrong. One failure and the entire mission would have been disrupted, but it worked. It'll take about six months of calibrating and testing before scientific data can finally start flowing back to Earth. I'm ecstatic. This is such an amazing opportunity. This Edmonton astronomer's research will use the telescope's ability to see infrared light. Until now, clouds of stellar soot blocked astronomers from getting a good look at the Triangulum Galaxy. We'll see clearer and more detailed pictures, but we'll also get this new view that was inaccessible to Hubble by basically seeing through this material. It's like looking through a fog for the first time. We don't know what this Quebec astronomer will be using her time with the telescope to determine whether planets in the TRAPPIST-1 solar system have an atmosphere. 
If they do have an atmosphere, then that means there may, there may be a chance to, to look for traces of life on, in those atmospheres. We know on Earth we need an atmosphere to, to live, basically. Okay. So While right she says it's all very exciting, um, there's a lot of pressure, like, too. It is, like, very stressful, <laughs> I, have to, I, have, I have to admit. No one has ever worked with a telescope like this before. The James Webb will literally look back in time more than 13.5 billion years, all the way back to the first galaxies that formed. We only have very limited information on this part of the universe because previous telescopes just haven't been able to see there. This cosmic eye is bound to see things that will alter our very understanding of the universe. There's going to be a huge number of surprises that come back from this telescope. It really is set up to kind of open discovery space and find things that we weren't expecting to find. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Montreal. The hope is we'll start to get photos by the summer. I, for one, cannot wait to see all the data that comes out of all this and, uh, and learn what it all means for, for life here on Earth and beyond. That's it for CBC Vancouver News on this Monday night. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you tomorrow.